And we are back for another episode of the False Nine. Buddy, is this three weeks in a row? This is crazy. Yeah, yeah, seriously. It's, it's, it's good while it lasts. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're on a run right now. We're on a run. Yeah. Uh, so we've actually kept our promise and started putting out more content every week. Uh, we have a really cool guest on, actually, who pertains to not only, you know, soccer and MLS and stuff that we want to talk about, but has a connection to the Kirk Minahan world. So we are on the Kirk Minahan network. So. Uh, let's welcome Tommy Quinlan in from WPRO and the Revs podcast. Let's go. Uh, you know what? Don't set the expectations high because I will miss him. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I've chatted with Tom a lot, like on Twitter, like gotten to know, like just his content, the stuff he does. And then obviously you were kind of a big storyline for a day or two earlier this year with Cullinane and Justin on the Kirk Min show. So like how fucked up, how wrong was Cullinane in that situation? You know what? I I had more fun with it than really because it's it turned out not to be a big fucking deal. Yeah. Uh, it was more so like how? Like just, you know, it was so, it was so <laughs> stupid. Like there's no reason for me to be introduced into this world like that. Like, like that. You know, like there was just it came out like and I appreciate him doing it's he, like he goes above and beyond for everybody. Like before I actually like I knew Colin Ain when he, he was producing Jerry and he got me Jerry on WPRO a couple of times. So Colin Ain goes above and beyond for people. Yeah. I think he got a little excited because I think he wanted to make daddy happy. Yeah. He wanted Justin to get that job and, and all that stuff. And you're like, dude, it's not even posted yet. Like the job isn't posted yet. It, it's just I, like, you know, because yeah. then, you know, I'm letting down people and now I'm fucking up and now I'm going to end up in a world of hurt. So I, I'm preventing a big issue here that was created because somebody wanted to please daddy, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the, basically, yeah, that, that's exactly what happened. So let, let's I, ask I you this. Said, hold on. I, I literally yeah. said on Kirk and Alpha, I'm like, Tommy, hire Justin. What the fuck? And I had no idea what was going on, but just because they said it on Kirk's show. So I was like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, let's ask you this. Are you, uh, do you listen to the show a lot every day? Are you like, were you a Kirk fan? Like how, how did that whole situation yeah, I listen regularly. I mean, so I first started listening to Kirk way when I was living in Florida. That's when I was listening consistently. Uh, when him and him and Cal, you know, him and Cal, K and C, yeah, fucking, you know, I thought really were killing it. I thought they were actually doing something that the height of radio to me. That was the height of radio. It reminded, like, I come from New York, so like I grew up listening to a lot of Opie and Anthony and you know Howard Stern. Well, and and really, you know, really understanding it later years what they were doing and and that. So that type of radio is like it's a it's a lost art. So to be yep. able to perfect that, especially in a you know market like this that really does embrace it, you know, he was he for me is somebody I looked up to like, Hey, you know, there's still, you know, walls you can break in this business. Fortunately, some walls came crashing down, but you know, it's, <laughs> he, yeah, he got me through a lot of shit when I was living in the hell hole of Pensacola. Like I was like, I had, Oh, two, you were in Pensacola, Florida. Oof. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, some people, you know, nowadays just, they don't, not many people, especially in radio in general. I don't know why I did this, but I, you know, I not many people uproot their lives and go chase their radio dreams in Pensacola. But for some reason, I did because I thought it would, you know, whatever. So I end up every day just being beaten down by just some of the worst <laughs> people down there in, in the business that have no idea what they're doing, and which is why they'll never leave Pensacola. Love the place to death, but um, you know, you're dealing with really crappy people in this business and when you understand how to deal with crappy people in this business you're just in the shit every day so you know listening to kirk i could sympathize because yeah. you know you're you're fighting an uphill battle every day so and you did you also had uh steve on your uh, talk show didn't you uh yes you he, had... was cool. he was really receptive you know yeah uh, hit me up hit me back right away and we did it once and yeah and yeah that's... all right that's I think I that that's that. that's how it began, and I think then Kirk forgot about me, which is good. Yeah, he did. Yeah, introduced and then forgotten about, and then Cullinane re brought me back into the world unnecessarily, <laughs> and then almost Love caused I, me to get murdered. So you know, yeah. If I was re like like 
really making content or really trying to make like a living like in content, like I would definitely want Kirk to forget about me. That'd be like the best. Like, <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. Like, and, but here's the thing. Like that first time I got like, he gave, he like, he gave the interview good props. You know, he, he poked fun at it, which, you know, whatever. But like, it was, hey, for, for a, a first time, you know, it's, it could go a lot worse and it didn't. So <laughs> be happy. <laughs> So, all right. So you said you grew up in New York and yeah. anyone who follows you now, you, you host a, a Revs podcast with uh, a kid. I like, you know, a little bit younger than me that grew up my cousin, Mike D who's on hot one Oh six. Uh, and Nick Chiamelli, I think is the third guy. Am I saying his Giuliano, name right? Giuliano, but I will be saving that as a drop. I will be saving. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. That's awesome. No problem. All right. So you host a revs podcast that I called into, I got into last year when they were making their playoff run. I really like the way that you guys break down the revs. You're obviously a fan. You're, you're obviously into it growing up in New York. Like, so stop it there real quick. I'm not a fan. Okay. No, you're not a fan. That. I'm not a fan. All right. Great. I, so Here's how awesome. my, here's how I've stayed up here. Here's the reason why I've stayed up here and been in New York and that stayed up here. In 2010, I won a Totally Patriots TV contest. Remember that TV show on BZ? Totally Patriots was like a yeah. show. So I was a soft, I was a freshman going into my sophomore year of college. And I, you know, you're trying to make ways to try to make an impact. You know, your communications major and you're trying to fight your way in Boston, especially being so I auditioned and I got it and I won, you know, I, I, I was one of like six people. I think the same year that was me and Reem. I think me and Reamer might've been on the same year. Like we were a couple of weeks apart and I, there was like a couple of people in there that were like, are, are in Boston media today. So like, it was a pretty good group of people. And, um, so, so, uh, so I do, so I do that. And like, to be honest, like I was so grateful for everything that, like working with craft sports productions, like that was like, Oh shit. Like this place is awesome. Like this yeah. is like a great place to work. And let's be honest. It's miserable to be in New York. <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> it's between ownership and you know, the, how many teams you're dealing with down there. It's just, it's a different vibe up here. And I, I really like the way, at least from a, you know, that they do things up here in between Foxborough and um, definitely the way they run the, what the Celtics and, you know, the Bruins are fun to watch. So, you know, the sports scene is, was like really, you know, a blast and, you know, being a Mets fan, you know, it's like, fuck the Yankees. And so that's, you know, watching Red Sox games is, you, you kind of, you, you had a, you're you a kinship. You already have a kinship. Yeah. 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 So, so, so yeah, so it was, <clears throat> it was the perfect area. And I, and I was always a big fan of soccer, but you know, I enjoy So covering the revs was an easy choice for me because I think, the organization itself is, you know, its foundation is really good. And we could talk about other issues with it later, but mm -hmm. the, I, I think the crafts are actually probably one of the few owners in sports in America that are just real people. What, what club did you support when you were home? Like when you were in New York? I'll be honest. When I, I 2010 was like the first year during the world cup in South Africa, where I really locked in, you know, you know, growing up, it was more, learning like going like really in high school was the first time I started understanding the sport of soccer. Cause when I yeah, was growing up, I'm watching basketball, baseball, my parents were coaching basketball. So I really didn't get exposed to soccer until high school. And then I really didn't see the international game until college. So it really didn't start for me until, you know, my freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's great. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that you weren't a fan. So you come at it from like a journalistic sort of outsider's perspective. Um, when you're doing the revs. So what made you now 10 years later, 12 years later, keep doing a podcast about them? You're obviously like, you're into it. Like I see your tweets, you tweet a lot about it. What, what has brought you to like, do you see that that's like an untapped market that it keeps growing and growing and growing and you're kind of want to want to be there at the beginning of it, or you just become, it's you like, you love the sport now. You're basically all in. I want to be at the beginning of this because I think they are the future. Like, I think they are building something for what is a, I think a team that is going to be a, 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 a staple in the Boston sports market. And I, I really do hope they build in Boston because that's a really big key to all of this, but yep. it's, it, they, they've made leaps and bounds from, you know, it all took just craft to spend a little bit of money and finding somebody like a Bruce arena to come in here, to turn things around, to make it realize, Oh my God, we have such an incredible market here with so much untapped potential. You don't, Huge. you know, you really don't have experts on TV, radio talking about 
It's uh, it's gross. I think that what we do, and I would say that what Revolution Recap does, and you know what guys at the Bet Musket do, is you know more than what the mainstream does. And Dan Roach and BZ has done more than any other mainstream outlet in the area for 25 years. That's a fact. But in terms of you know, we got to pump out content every day to stay in the forefront of everybody's mind. And it's the independent media that is going to one day get picked up by these mainstream outlets as long as we stay with it. Um, so I just to, I to piggyback off of that, to piggyback off of that, it's one of my biggest complaints and why now I'm starting to get more into because I think so what I said to you off here is guys like me and Buddy are the untapped, right? We're older. We've been lifelong soccer fans. And it's not a product that I used to like really care about, look at. And then there was no way to get it covered, right? Like you never, there was no shows. There was no time on uh, uh, the local places. I'll never forget listening to like Bert, uh, Bertrand and Zolak do like two minutes with like Brad Friedel. And it was just so awkward and bad. <laughs> and and then like you see like today, no shot, no, no disrespect to anybody. Like um, if they're friends, like you see Sarge Riley is hosting like a, a, nine, uh, uh, a Revs podcast now. You know, and I'm like, dude, they're just like taking this guy who doesn't want to like who's not doing anything else. They're like, oh, here, take the reds. That's the way I look at it. And like, so it's smart on you guys to keep doing this, to keep pumping it out, because you're right. It's growing huge, like to the point where I now watch the Reds games. I watch most of the Rev games. I know, you know, they're they're players um, mm -hmm. like Carlos Gill to me, buddy. What do you think? Carlos Gill easily could play on, you know, did come from Europe. But even right now, the way he's playing, I could easily see him on a mid-table European team, no, no problem starting. Oh, yeah, 100%. He's, he's very talented. He's, he's um, and, like, that's, like, a difference. I mean, obviously, the Revs had, like, they drafted Clint Dempsey, but that's a difference in, like, where the Revs have, like, come in, like, the last, like, 10 years, too, is, like, Absolutely. being able, getting a DP like that, getting, like, a great player, like, who, who is, like, who is quality. Like, like you're seeing DPs all over the league. Like, like it was tough being a Revs fan in the beginning, like, of designated players because, to Tommy's point before, Kraft doesn't, didn't spend money on the Revs. And, like, and if, and if he did, it was, like, okay, he kind of paid Showery, like, a little bit. And, like, that was, like, a talking point for, like, a little bit, like, around here. But, like, but like now they they sign quality def like, like uh, designated players. They have Bruce Arena, like Tommy said. They have a great coach. Like they're they're starting to build something that is like it's not it's I had season tickets like to re, like Jay Heaps last year like I just I went to every game and just yelled trash heaps every game like that was it like I just like I hated them so much but like <laughs> like they've even from what's that two three years they've grown so much like it's it's great to see the Brad Friedel year was tough the Brad Friedel year was tough and, and yeah. you, know, you mentioned Zolak and Bertrand and, and I want to make sure I mention them too because they've been really they've actually been st like they've been awesome when it comes I to know it, it's tough on them it's not their first love you know it's tough no, it's definitely not their first love but at least they're trying that's the main yeah thing. yeah yeah no doubt but you mentioned Friedel and Friedel was kind of dry if you're oh, not especially, God. especially if you're not a soccer person or if you're oh. on the fringe that's not the type of guy that's going to uh, light up a room when he walks in the guy no. that you need is bruce and that's kind of the it's the personality and that's what maz talked about after they lost to nycfc it's that personality that is drawing people in that makes people want to check this thing out so it's a combination of what you said buddy that they brought in Carlos Hill. They finally spent a little bit of money. They did go out there and bring in some other really good uh, MLS veteran talent that understands how to win in this league. And now in year, what is this, year five, going on year four of the project, I guess, uh, now you got to get the thing over the, over the finishing line because you know how to win. You've got the pieces. Mm -hmm. You can win. They, they just – I, so I, yeah. let, 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 let's talk about let's let's talk about the Miami game. That that was a disappointing. Ever since the blown lead against RSL, uh, that in that cold game where they came out complaining that it was too cold, they shouldn't have played, which was you know just disheartening to hear. Like toughen up. Um, yeah. uh, like Buxta's from fucking Poland. Like he's fucking fine. Like he'll be okay. <laughs> um, so ever since that game, it's just like they seem out of sorts, especially defensively, because they're scoring goals. Like they even got two goals. You know this weekend. What's going on back? Omar Gonzalez, is he washed? Is he washed? No, I think oh. Omar. First, I, I think Omar should be here. Um, and if I keep talking too much, buddy, just tell me to shut the fuck up. I'm sorry. I, you no, know. no, no, no. You're good. You're but, the guest. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think Omar's washed up. And I, I think it's um, – I think Omar and Andrew was a good combination. I think the problem lies in – uh, the midfield, 
And I think the pro- problem problem lies in the fact that they just don't have any real wingers. I mean, you know, I think Omar, yeah, I think here's the thing. Like you can't expect Omar and Josie to be these m- game changing players at this stage of their career. They're very important depth pieces and they're very true. Pieces. Mm-hmm. But if for anybody that comes in here and comes in here and bashes Omar and Josie on a weekly basis, you're just – you're missing what their purpose is here, you know, and it's a waste of time to be, you know, talking about them like that. You know, you got to talk, you, you know, it's, it's more about, and granted, you know, you would hope that you, but the depth would be better, but you know, you know, that's a, that's a different story. And I we could talk about that too. But I thought I think, when they, when they brought Omar in, it was like, like, in my opinion, I'm like, Oh, he's a great piece for the locker room. You know, he's, he's won championships with Bruce before like he gets it, like been on the national team, been, been to world cup qualifiers, all that kind of stuff. So I thought, like I was like, oh, he'll be, he'll be great for like the development of like of like that the, their defensive pair and like uh, and how that like like their shape and stuff. But like he's he actually is playing a lot more than I kind of thought he was going to. But. Well, I mean, I think the injury to Henry to start the year was the beginning of you know him emerging into a role larger than expected. For, and you know that that's that's part of the issue too is and kind of you know projected that at the beginning of the year where he said you were going to need to rely on your depth i think they're relying it more than they were hoping to but i think a lot of it comes down to just i mean this team is so broken coming into the year right now i mean and bruce doesn't want to use it as an excuse but i think it's a reality you know they're just they haven't been able to feel the a, a healthy starting 11 all year and you know i think omar did fine to start the year the problem is is that They've just found ways to lose that are just astonishing. Uh, I think it's it's the last several it's, weeks. It's kind of not scary, but like it's it's evident how how bad they missed Taj too. Like stretching the field, like just being able to like quick strike the other way. Like it, like I think this team looks a lot different if Taj is still here. But. Taj is yeah. I, I I've never heard him call, call Taj before. I like that though. We're gonna oh, go with yeah. Taj. Yeah. Taj Buchanan. Taj Buchanan. Taj Buchanan. I like that. Uh, so. But, yeah. But but yeah, you're right. No, that's but but you you're, you hit it on the money. Tejon has not been replaced. That's a lot of money that you've got sitting in the bank that you haven't replaced. I think a big part of the reason why is because the World Cup is in the winter, so it makes it harder to bring in guys. You know, the MLS transfer windows are so out of whack. So I think I think they're hamstrung now. I think they're hamstrung in the summer, and I think they're hamstrung in the winter too because. I don't know if a lot of these guys are going to want to come to Foxborough in, you know, late March and April after, you know, playing in the World Cup if, or if the options to go back and play in the Premier League or the Bundesliga. So, you know, they haven't replaced that dynamic player. And the thing is, is that because you haven't replaced that dynamic player, you're relying more on guys like Dewan and Brandon come up higher. And because they have to come up higher, it's, you know, they, they had gotten exposed on counterattacks last year, but, you know, I think it was they recovered a lot better, but because of you know what Brandon and Duan try to create for you offensively, they get caught out more, and that's what you've seen so far this year. And also, you know, Matt Turner's there to to save the day on a lot of these plays, where oh. <laughs> you know we're not seeing that right now. We are not seeing that right now. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is you know Matt would get you those would win you those games um, in really tight situations. Like I go back to the NYCFC game where I think. Uh, it, at Red Bull Arena, where Matt Turner became a star, and I think that's where Matt Turner really opened the eyes of European um, uh, uh, scouts, and 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 he would come up big in those moments. And I think that's where you know, perfect example is you know Brad letting in that that last goal. Uh, Gross. So bad. You know, that doesn't, so that bad. Doesn't happen with Matt Turner. You know, there's no. there's a Twitter page, understandably so, that's dedicated to does Matt Turner save that? And it's because he is the best shot stopper when yeah. he's healthy. Any probably anywhere in the world. Like I think he will make that case when he goes over to Arsenal. I mm, think. Uh, we, mm, I think me and Buddy we, said last week we we asked that would Matt stop it with uh, Zach Steffen against Costa Rica? It was like yeah, get out of here. To the, yep, like the, to neither it. one of them would have scored. They wouldn't have scored. Matt Turner is the second most exciting player on the revolution. And that's just, and, and that was even with Tejon last year, Matt Turner won you so many games. Yep. It was like, he, I'm going to miss him when he goes, I will true. Like I, I said, I'm not a fan of this team, but I was such a fan of Matt 
because, and I'm still a fan of Matt because of who the person he is. Like I underdog story. Underdog. He's absolutely, he's the most humble down to earth person you could imagine. <clears throat> that is not Corona. And, um, <laughs> Does he wear eyeliner though? Because his eyes always look weird. You know what it is? I'm he just dates, kidding. He dates a, um, <laughs> a cheerleader who I think is like, you know, a part time model. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, he's entering the Tom Brady world. Like he is like fashionista going to be, I mean. He's going to be living in London, you know? Yeah. Oh, right. He's be living in London. He's probably going to be on magazines at some point. He's probably going to be taking whatever Tom Brady's taking to like look 20 years younger. Which, by the way, did you see that? That's but called plastic surgery, Tom. That's called plastic surgery, bud. No, there's some steroids involved in there. Oh, like, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, you know, his facial structures and he's leaning like crazy, like. He was a little fat little porker at one point. And then all of a sudden he moves out and he looks like he could, you know, be doing triathlons. Like what's going on? Yeah. Wow, there's, I want to take what he's taking when I'm a millionaire. <laughs> uh, so I want to get into, so I, I don't want to go too deep into the revs because so shout out really quick. You do host a revs podcast. Why don't you tell the people the name of that if they want to get deep into the revs. So that's new England soccer weekly. Uh, we do try to uh, make sure we cover the rest of the league as well. We try not to cheap everybody out on uh, just coverage in general, just keeping you guys updated with uh, really the most important storylines around the we league week to week. This week, we're actually going to have Alexi Lawless on the podcast. So, nice. Uh, oh, Good nice. get. Uh, yeah. It's, he, Alexi's uh, been a longtime friend of the show, and he's been always back to when I was working up in Boston where he would uh, come onto the podcast and – and do stuff for us. So I'm lo really looking forward to that. It's always something that comes out of those conversations and you learn something all, all the time with Alexi. And I think Alexi, quite frankly, you know, a lot of, a lot of people like to, you know, I think, um, I, I think a, a lot of people like to attack Alexi. And I think he, quite frankly, is, he proves that he's the best and, you know, announcer, I think, and, and I don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's definitely the best one of the top three analysts we have in the country. For sure. Yeah, I mean, no one's worse than Taylor Twelman, so that oh, I mean, you're fine there. The worst. He's the worst. The worst. Sure. He's the absolute fucking worst. But so anyway, like I want to give that the, the shout out there, and I want to transition more into overall MLS and then like overall revs and soccer culture here. So when I said earlier, it's like like I said, ten years ago, man, I would watch MLS, and it, it was just like not fun to watch. It wasn't a good product that they were putting out on the field, in my opinion. Like it was just very. Um, guys weren't as skilled. It was a lot of, you know, go, uh, uh, chuck and duck sort of soccer is what I like to call it. Uh, now you're seeing a product where I'll watch a game, man, like any game. You watch Portland play. You watch Seattle play. You watch everyone plays with the ball on the ground. They're trying to play the right way. You still see, like, the difference in Europe between here and, and the Europe is the final third of the field. You'll still see that here and there. And squad depth, right? So that's where mm -hmm. when you were talking earlier, uh, Tommy, about the Revs' depth, I think that's the biggest thing. If you took, like, if MLS could put their all-star team in a European league, I think they would easily battle for, you know, top four or five in, in, in a lot of leagues, okay? I think where the drop-off is is in that final third of the roster where you got guys making, like, $65,000 a year, $75,000 a year. So is that the next step for this league, Tommy, basically, is what I'm asking, is to get it to where those guys, your backups coming in, you're not going to see such a drop-off from, like, a Carlos Gill. I think more teams are investing. They've got to raise the salary cap for sure, but progress is slow. And that's something that Alexi would say is that progress is slow in terms of how you can overall enhance a roster. Uh, but I think you're right that a lot of the top tier players that you have in this league really could make an argument that they could be playing internationally for sure. And I think the narrative is changing overall on MLS. I think the problem is, is that we focus too much on Europe. And I think we should be focusing more on, okay, what are they doing in South America? What are they doing in Central America? Because that's where we Great point. In the world. Great point. And I think there's this obsession that we have to be the Premier League because it is the greatest league in the world. And we have to be La Liga and we have to be, but, but that's not where we are. And, and I think we have to tap more into our Hispanic base and try to play the way that they play. Because I think that's, First off, how we don't finish third in CONCACAF. That's a big, that's part of the problem, you know, is that I think our American style doesn't replicate what the rest of the region is doing. So, uh, or at least, you know, try, and I think it's gotten better, especially with this youth movement that's going on, but it's taken a while to get to this point. Uh, but I think there's this overall obsession in everybody's mind that we have to be Europe. And it's just, 
I, I, I think we have to be fo more focused on creating better talent. We, you know, and take in that European talent. That's not what I'm not shying away from that, but creating a style that I think is enviable by the Europeans, you know, and, and I think it's, it's that, it, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, definitely. So like, I, I think that the one move that they made, and I don't know, buddy, if you know this, they're actually going to suspend the league next season for a month. Uh, either it's next season or the season after. I can't remember where I read it. And they're doing like a tournament between the MLS and the Mexican Premier League where they see. actually they're going to combine it and they're going to shut down the league for a month. And I think that right there, that could be absolutely huge. That will actually bring TV ratings. Like you said, Tommy, you're tapping into like the rest of the region. The Mexican League is huge and you're tapping into the Hispanic market. You might be opening yourself up now well, to yeah. where that untapped market. So the ratings really amaze me because they can't, the MLS has a problem breaking half a million viewers. They were, and, yep. and that's, and then you look at what else is on TV and what does break a million viewers. And it's like, how is an MLS able to compete with all elite wrestling, which is pulling <laughs> yeah. 1, 1 million viewers, or, you know, they went from 700,000 viewers to a million viewers. You know, how do you, how do you like, that's, that's a real number. And I know it's like, kind of like, you know, why are we talking about wrestling? But you have to look at that and say, this is a brand new wrestling company, right? Yeah. That had, you know, they added one guy and they take their ratings from 770,000 people every week to a million. MLS can't break 500,000 and they've got some of the most exciting players anywhere in the world. And honestly, some of the most exciting atmosphere because the culture has gotten better because you have way better stadiums that fit in yep. the culture better but the problem is is that it doesn't translate to a national audience and that's a real problem and i don't know what it's going to take at this point to get people to you know sit down and watch these games and you know is it because you know you're putting you're burying minnesota and austin on a sunday night at you know 7 30 8 o'clock is that part of the problem? I don't, I mean, gambling, I don't. gambling, Tommy, gambling, 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 I, I, gambling. That's what's gambling. More MLS. More people have come into MLS because of the gambling. And me. That's I'm telling you right now, me, me, Montana. like, uh, Montana, like, like to me, I would do like a night, like, a, like for instance, yesterday, Sunday at seven o'clock, you had the Red Sox Yankees. You had, um, the Celtics were on the NBA was finishing. I would have had a 10 o'clock West coast uh, kickoff on FS one. You would have been the only thing on. And you would have had the whole country in prime time at that time doing it. So, yeah, it's 10 o'clock on the East Coast. But, uh, you know, from this side of the Mississippi on, it's 7, 8, 9 o'clock. It's, it's prime time television for them. Like, I think that's a missed opportunity. I feel like they compete too often. They need to find their own niche windows, you know, They're whether it be Wednesday at 8 o'clock, you know, whatever. Pick a day and make that your, your game. The windows are bad. Like, I don't like the – I don't like the way that – MLS competes against NFL Sunday. I think oh, they, it's nuts. It's stupid. It, it doesn't make it's any sense. <laughs> sense at all. At I all. Think, I think they should own Friday nights. Yes. Own Friday nights. And then I think you play your secondary national games on Saturdays. You play your big boy games on Friday nights, Friday night lights, build it up yep. as a big thing. You can even get Amazon involved because mm -hmm. everybody's getting Amazon. Great involved. idea. And then – because because then because then you could do double headers like you could do you could do a seven thirty game which is your East Coast game and then you could do a nine o'clock game I don't know like like NBA on TNT does it and you have the NH, you know TNT has yeah. created such a great model that I don't understand why MLS doesn't follow up on it maybe because they don't believe in Friday night games but and I don't know what you know numbers they look at to justify that but I think you know you talk about finding a home that's where they need to find a home I hate that the fact that they go up especially because like. I think they'll put a full slate it's against the NFL. It's crazy. It's yeah, it's, crazy. It, it, yeah, buddy, go. No, I was just gonna say, like, it's different if you want to go up like like two p.m. on a Sunday, like August like third. You know, like if like all if you want to go all through the summer playing Sunday like two and five, however you want to do it, that's fine. But like once you get to September, like you have to know your beat. Like if you want people to see your product, you can't. You like it doesn't matter if it's if it's the greatest sell traffic ever. Nobody's watching that over like Pat's Chiefs or any or any like mid NFL game. I think people get soccered out too by the end of the day because it starts so early that, you know, you start mm -hmm. your morning. Everybody's watching the Premier League. Everybody's yep. watching the Bundesliga now. Everybody, because you, like you said, of gambling. And unless you're really in, into it, unless you're really, really into it, I don't know if people are really hanging around six hours later to come back to watch. So I think 
that's why beating M uh, the Premier League to the punch might keep more people around for you because you're not competing against that. Especially if you're, you know, if you're watching Liverpool, Man City to start Sunday morning, are you really going to stick around for Austin in Minnesota? Yeah. If I got money on it, yeah. If you got money on it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of them are, you know, so there you go. So that's the thing is that, you know. So, well, I just do think that more legalized gambling in more states will eventually help MLS, and especially if they embrace it. They should but, really but, fucking embrace it. Like, they should embrace it. Weed. You can you can get it anywhere. You can gamble anywhere at any time nowadays. People know how to get in touch with a bookie. Uh, no, you know? no doubt, Tommy. But the legalized ones is where the props come in, and that's where now it's taken the next level. Is the prop stuff? First time goal scorer, anytime goal scorer, yellow cards, corner kicks, offsides. Your illegal books don't carry that, and I'm we, telling you that that's what makes it more fun because soccer is a lot of stuff you can bet on that you could do in that in within the game itself. You guys were talking about TNT before. I was watching the Bruins last night. Cap score. They they post the odds right on the screen, dude. Like they like yeah. So they're like okay, hockey's like, embraced the fuck out of it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, like it it and it can, I it it can only help. I'm sure. Like like uh, I, this isn't like this isn't port. I mean, I, I saw Josh talking about port like the other day. Like where there's some mat, maybe he, like he doesn't. Not, he's not saying match fixing, but he's like saying they're like the. Uh, no, he's like, saying match fixing. Stuff. Portugal's yeah. definitely known for match fixing, but no, no, I, no I know, but like, but like, but like. 20 years ago it was i feel like it's way easier to do that than now like i don't worry about that in mls you know yeah. but like but like until until they embrace it like i don't i just don't see like how it grows it's it's like i like we love like we love soccer and like you you said we're not mls guys it's the i'm it's becoming it though i'm definitely yeah. i'm definitely more into it than i've ever been than I, i've I'll ever say, been i'll, I'll say, say like like yeah Go ahead, go ahead, Tommy. No, 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 no. Finish. I'm sorry. I right. you. I'm like, sorry. like, like, ten years ago, like I would, I would talk to my like a friend, say, and, and like who big Roma fan, like watches every match in Serie A, like, and I'm like, hey, like you watch the Reds. He's like, I just can't get into it because the quality is so bad. And and I could, I could honestly relate to him now. But like to your point before, like I, I love watching MLS games now. Like, like it's like the the venues are exciting. Like the 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 attacking, they all attack. Yeah, no yeah, one yeah, packs it. No one packs it in that league. No one exactly. packs it in. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I, I Colorado like it. maybe. Actually, I'll take that back. Colorado might pack it in. And, and Bruce. And Bruce will pack it in. And Bruce will pack it in. If he's got a one nothing lead, Bruce is packing it in. Yeah, you're you're right on there. You're but, right. But, so yeah. go ahead, Tom. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. This is your show. I'm, I'm just... No, so what I was gonna say is I kind of wanted to talk about atmosphere. So you guys have both brought up atmosphere, right? So yeah. let's get into the elephant in the room here, okay? You look around the league, Charlotte yesterday. I watched that game, it was in the afternoon, it was like right. Uh, I think after the uh, the the Premier League game, I went right into. I was still in soccer mode, so I watched that Charlotte Atlanta game. Charlotte sold out, sixty thousand people. Place was fucking buzzing. Okay, you go to you watch a Portland game. They have their stuff. Seattle Sounders, Atlanta, Atlanta uh, fills a fucking dome, man, a dome. We shouldn't be playing soccer in a dome. It's two thousand twenty-two, but whatever. What needs to happen here, Tommy? What needs to happen here? I, I'm telling you, I think the sport will explode in this region if we have a 30 or 40,000 seat stadium in Boston. There you go. There's your answer. Is that is that too big though? Yeah, I would say I, I would go 25. I would go between 25. 25. I would honestly go between. I think the smaller the better because I want a loud stadium atmosphere. You want everyone on top of the field. You know, and then yep. you can build with the opportunity to expand. You know, and that's always an option for any stadium nowadays. Uh, uh, there's always, I think, ways that you can expand. Will it ever it? happen with uh, the Crafts ownership group? Will it ever happen with the Crafts being owners since they have the stadium all here already that's paid for? So why yeah, move? Why, if you're, if they're, if you're them, why move? Well, I would say that if you're going to Neverett, better known as Everett, Massachusetts, I call it Neverett because they will never go to ne Everett as much <laughs> as people want them to build that stadium <laughs> next to Encore. It'll never. Yeah happen so and if you uh, have been to encore you don't want it to happen it's fucking uh, ha terrible to try to get in that place it's a dumpy area there yeah are, yeah needs the revs more than the revs need everett you know one thousand percent because because at the because it makes no sense for bob Kraft to build up another mall when he's got to fund his own mall you know that's, so that's my whole point yeah you know i'm going i've been to Foxborough on a Friday night. You know, they're putting people into Scorpion Bar now. They're putting more people into that place that used to be uh we'll, we'll just still Bar Louie. It. It's Bar uh, uh Bar Louie you know, gets packed up. Yeah. You know, the country yep, bar. is there, right? 
it's whatever the new place called. I think it's called like oh. five strings now or seven. Oh, strings yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no idea. But the point is, is that they're building up Patriot Place as a destination for millennials to go. And what better way to kind of, you know, if you're going to, if you're not going to be in Boston, what better way to grow people to come to your mall on a Friday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon, uh, then, you know, in the summertime, putting that stadium across the street, like it's just, it would be a year round happening now, you know, if they could figure out a way to build in Boston, they're going to Boston, but if they're not getting in Boston, it's going in Foxborough and that's it. Okay. So like how far away though? I mean, I've been hearing this since they bought the fucking team 25 years ago, you know, like, so like, is this just something that they're like teasing along, teasing along? So we just keep going. Like, I, I don't, when is the end game here? I guess it, it's the city. You need you need cooperative politicians who are willing to allow this thing. To so they're never going to build in Boston then. <laughs> I mean, like that's just not. I mean, that's, look who we yeah, have there. Like, that's, like, that's a, but 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 nobody talks about that side of it. Nobody talks about the underhanded political maneuvering that's gone on to prevent any. I mean, part of craft to build in Boston, and yeah, there is. People that say he's a billion, like take the most recent example, the area that Brian Bolello, because I've been, you know, dealing with these people for eight years now. When I first started interviewing Brian Bolello on the stadium, the place that they always said that they wanted to be was the Bayside Expo Center. Yep. We had the entire thing planned out. This thing was like, it was money. They had it done. And the Boston Teachers Union with some politicians in that area, uh, Michael Flaherty, the city councilman being one of them, stopped, found a way to stop that st uh, land purchase from happening uh, because the Boston Teachers Union didn't want to move. They wanted Kraft to move uh, you know, them out. And it was just, it was, became such a headache that Kraft said, screw it. And they lost out on the bid. And, um, we, I mean, we, we, this could all be figured out very easily. The city is your biggest deterrent here. And nobody talks about that. Everybody talks about the fact that Kraft's a lazy billionaire that doesn't want to do anything to help the reps. Granted, they have half a point when you look at what they've done up until the Bruce Arena era, uh, even though they've been to a bunch of MLS Cups, but they just didn't spend the money. Now they're spending the money and they're seeing the reward of spending money. But I think the stadium, I think nobody talks about the other side of the story where the city has been the real problem in getting anything done. Like Witted yeah. Circle is another example that could have been figured out very easily. You could have the stadium right there and they, um, you have a bunch of city neighborhood groups that are fighting back against it. And as somebody told me recently, if the neighborhood groups don't want it, it's not it happening. It ain't happening. Yeah. And, no. What about what about our neck of the woods? Uh, well, not mine anymore, but where Buddy is. Where? What about Providence? Would that ever be a viable option? You think? No. You know, no. I, it, okay. I think it, it to like the point we're trying to make, where like the revs could grow. That it they'd have like a loyal fan base, but I don't see how they could grow. Like if they put them in like yeah. they say down by the water in Pawtucket, wherever they want to put them. Like I don't see how they grow. The th the other thing they have to do too is is that you you have to get people to the stadium now. You just, you, you can't, we can't live on the excuse anymore that it's Foxborough and we, I mean, you just, you have to start putting more people in that stadium on a regular basis. Granted, you know, 17,000 people that show up in an MLS stadium, like Red Bull, like Red Bull arena would kill for 17,000 people. Like, but the problem is, you know, the revs play in Gillette. So you're playing in a six. It looks, it looks way worse. It looks, it looks way, way worse. worse. But if you were to put that in Red Bull arena, they would kill for that. And it would honestly, yeah. it wouldn't be a sellout, but it would be incredibly loud and it would look awesome on television. And it would be a real, like you wouldn't feel like you're not at a soccer game. So, yeah. is you know, it, and yeah. that's the issue to me. It's like when you go, when I do try to go watch the Revs, uh, when I've gone, it doesn't feel like I'm at a, a soccer stadium because I'm not. I'm at a football stadium. You it, know? it was fun in there. Like, like, I know what you mean, but it was fun in there versus NYCFC, like for a while. Like, it was, Oh, yeah. No, uh, I, you know, that atmosphere, obviously... that yeah. atmosphere was awesome. It's the yeah. people. You need more people like you guys to mm -hmm. go to the games. And that's, yeah. what to be honest, I saw that. I saw that shift. I don't remember what game it was, but I saw it in the fort. 
where in the fort you saw different, I thought I would, I started seeing different faces that seemed more into it that you weren't seeing before and seeing different people showing up around the stadiums and talking about the games. And, you know, the demographics started getting to a place where I think your median age, I think you want that median age at 35, 36, 37 years old. You know, you don't, and, and I may, and maybe they might be there. I think they're still in that family demo. So that that's the issue with the revs but that I see is you watch other MLS stadiums. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you watch other MLS stadiums and you see like the you know fans like actual card. I think the revs and MLS switched years ago when they got rid of Metro Stars and all those sure. shitty fucking names. But I think the revs still do cater because I have friends who are like soccer coaches, whatever. They're like, oh, we're taking the whole team, and it's like that's yeah, fun, yeah. but it's not. That doesn't give you but, that atmosphere, you know. And but think about it this way though too. So like the kids that were ten years old during the twenty fourteen MLS Cup run, they're now eighteen years old. And if they were fans back then and they carry over, now they're driving. So, you know, you need to, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the problem is, is that you need a lot of those fans that we've been talking about, kids and families showing up for years. They just got to grow up and they yeah. got to they got to fucking spend money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, know? I'll give you this. I, I, I'll bet my life that the average soccer MLS fan is the median age is 20 years younger than the average MLB fan. Uh, I'll bet my life on that. It, it, yeah, it, it is, but, but baseball, I, you know what? I really, I, I, I look around opening weekend and I think people are excited. Baseball's back. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, cause I think baseball is finding a little momentum again. I don't think it's dead. I think, you know, for all the soccer people that say baseball is dead, I don't, you know, DraftKings just paid Carabas a boatload of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 Red Sox, uh, you are Red Sox centric podcast. Uh, uh, so it's like, you know, it's it's one of those things where the sport is people want people still want baseball. No, I I mean I'll tell you this, me personally, who used to you be a hardcore base. Uh, you have to you think you have to p- compete against the people not in New York and not in LA necessarily. You have yep. to compete against the St. Louis markets, you have to compete against the Texas people, you gotta compete against you know, Chicago. Charlotte. Uh, yeah, I Charlotte. I mean, I don't know Charlotte as a baseball market, but you know, you Atlanta, you have to compete against, you know, just these old timey, you know, these old white, old money, you know, baseball advertising market. dollars and that, stuff. Yeah. You know, that's where they spend the most money. That's where Budweiser and all these places are spending the most money. And, and, yep. and going back to your point on sports gambling too, MLS is not, MLS is not embracing DraftKings. You don't see, dra- I don't see any DraftKings nope. anywhere around MLS games or, um, or, or even fantasy. So, like, forget gambling. Let's say that's, a, like, a bad word. Like, fantasy needs to, like, to me, that's the next level. If you see it's fantasy football helps the NFL. Fantasy baseball will still keep baseball somewhat relevant because people love stats. They love keeping track. They love playing uh, against their friends on a daily basis. And I do think, like, you're, you're absolutely right, Tommy. Like, they've got it. In, like, whoever is over there on the digital side has to start really getting into that and, and embracing that, that, that culture. You have to. I think it's just just because it's such an unregulated market still. And it's, you know, MLS is such at its infancy. It's like, you know, I think if you're going to do any gambling, it's just. And then do you think it's scared that some of these players only make $63,000 a year and they could be corrupted pretty fucking easily? Do you think they're worried about that? It's a good point. You know, you think about, well, what's his name Uh, from Atlanta? Uh, Just got jammed. Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley. (laughs) Yeah. You no, know, and he, I mean, he wasn't, I don't think he, he wasn't gambling against his own team, but no. he, um, you're absolutely right in that players, but I mean, you can say it for any sport nowadays. I mean, I think it's yeah. just it's like, it's kind of like, you know, athletes smoking weed. I think, you know, to hold them to that. Standard. And by the way, all these athletes do gamble and shit like that. We just don't want to hear about it. Just don't oh, get caught. Don't dummies. Smoke, just uh, don't get caught. Weed and they're just like, me. yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? just don't get caught. Just fucking don't get don't caught. Get dude. Caught. Like just that's don't it. Get caught, Let's know? do better. Don't all right. <laughs> so to, then lastly, I, I do want to get into, so where do you see like, you know, MLS in 10 years? Do you see it? As like competing, it, like does it surpass Mexican league around here? Is it number one league around here? Is that the goal? I mean, it's never going to be Europe until we we don't do relegation, like you just said, and we don't do the same calendar. And, and I don't think we'll ever get on the same calendar. So I think what you said, trying to get up to Mexico's level as far as how big Liga One is, 
and stuff like that it is to me the the goal. Do you disagree? Agree with that? Well, we got to beat Mexico in Concacaf Champions. Yep. Yep. And then we actually have to start beating them uh, on a regular basis across all competitions, and you know, finishing above them. And it's got to kind of be like the Arsenal Tottenham thing, right? We cannot be Tottenham. We have to be Arsenal, and you have to always be Tottenham. You always have to always be ahead of Tottenham. I don't know if that's the case anymore nowadays, but you get the point. Yeah. Um, you know, I think our approach needs to be, yeah, we need to at some point figure out a way to be the most dominant league. I don't think it's bad to want to be the best, you know. Is it tougher to be the best? Sure. But, you know, I think, it, you know what, it's something to aspire to. I think at one point the NHL, you know, we American hockey wasn't, you know, the best in the world. You know, we had to – and I don't think we're, we're still not the best in the world. And I think that's what makes watching USA hockey so much fun for a lot of people. Is yes. That underdog story. Underdog. I think is, it's gotten better where people don't shun it, but we're still an underdog overall. And I think in, and until we have that big moment on an international stage, we're going to continue to be that underdog. So I think everybody's going to be rooting really for Seattle to, win CONCACAF Champions League. I, I, I forget where they are with uh, aggregate with New York City FC. I, if, I think they played earlier this last week, or I think it's going to be this week, like twos this week. I forget off the top of my head. I, I mean, think Seattle's they, loaded, by the way, too. Coverage for loaded the squad. Yeah, and I, I, but yeah, I think it's, you know, I, you need a big moment and you need, you know, your marquee teams to kind of lead you in that direction. The Seattles, the LAFCs, the Los Angeles Galaxies. You would have hoped it was going to be the New York Red Bulls, but no, it's New York City FC, the stepchild that came out of nowhere. So um, now that oil my, money, that oil money goes city, a long yeah, way, my friend. That oil done. money goes a long way. I am, know? A city, I am a city fan. I am a plastic, and I absolutely adore the Qataris. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> Enjoy. Because here, here's the thing: it takes away from my pain as a Giants and Mets fan. And, so, <laughs> Need and that. Fan. So, so with with that though, like so is is the the academies to me is the biggest development in mls the five to eight years buddy like to me that's where europe and, and mexico and every other country has had you know academies and we were trying to do it we still do the draft where we draft the kids out of college and, mm -hmm. and that's fine that's an american thing that we probably will always have but i yeah. think the academies are the next step for this league and now even you're seeing them buying young south american players and then using them and then reselling we're a selling mm -hmm. league and like that's how you build your coffers and and, and I just think that's smart what they've done the last and, five, ten years. Too. And you can see like the clubs in the forefront too. Like they're they're they reap the benefits in MLS and like and like in their pockets where like FC Dallas makes a ton of uh, they're, they're making a ton of money. They have one of the best academies like this side of the world, you know. And if 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 hopefully like and, I, and there was always like the rev youth youth teams and stuff, but I don't think they ever like took the academy too seriously, you know. And hopefully that's that's the next step for them because it's just more money in like everybody's pocket as well, you know. As you just said, the coffers. But. Yeah, you you sell you sell finance. That's what the goal is at at that point to to build infrastructure and to build uh, mm -hmm. academies because there's just so much talent. I think even around here, wise that has just been you know untapped, and, and I'm just excited to to hopefully in the next ten years you're starting to see kids from around here making national teams and shit. Well, it's yep. because of the politics of it too. I mean, there's a lot of politics involved. Oh. With, you know, I'm just. American soccer in general. We're pay to play. We're play to play, Tommy. It's it's uh, it's gross. Yeah, and and and, it, and it's. I think a lot of it is. It's amazing the disrespect that a lot of these you know clubs just have for the revs. Now. Like a lot of them just the, these these club directors feel like they can just shun uh, the only MLS you know professional team in the area, and that's why you know you've seen guys go by the wayside and you know not <clears throat> be here uh, or just just you wonder like hey this kid's from massachusetts but didn't end up in the revs academy system how did yeah. that happen um and it's politics it's it's, it's politics it's, one thousand percent so i think um i i love what certain academies are doing like i loved you know for the few years that i was down in new york and i was working covering new york red bulls uh back in 2015 yeah 2015 that was a 20 uh 2016 um that was a really cool time because like you saw i, I like I, tyler I, adams alex mild at tyler adams like you saw a lot of real i mean just the molding of really something special um philadelphia has built up a really great yes academy. they have yep. um 
Obviously, Dallas, Dallas, I think, has one of the top performing academies overall. Amazing. Uh, MLS, you know, when you, you just you, Ricardo Pepe, I think, um, who else I, came out there? Kellen Acosta, I think. I think Weston, yeah. too. Weston yeah. came yeah. out of Dallas, too. Yep. So, and the cool thing, too, is, and I don't think a lot of people know this. So, one thing that's happened in South America and Europe for a long time is that if you're like the, like, all right, around here in Rhode Island, growing up, you had Bayside FC. That's like the big, like, academy, right? So if a kid came out of there and then signed with an MLS team and then that MLS team from, (laughs) yeah. And then that MLS team, though, I'm using this example, then sold them to a European team. Like Tejan got sold. You go for a lot of money, right? Now that rule changed a few years ago where that, what they call the, um, uh, a homegrown team, whoever raised that kid now gets, I believe like two or 3% of that sale for having that kid come through their academy the whole time. And that didn't happen until four or five years ago. So hopefully that helps this disconnect that you just talked about between, you know, local clubs and, you know, these, the, the, the MLS team around here. Uh, I think that's part of it. I still think, you know, a lot of just coaches feel like kids are better off staying away from the revs. You know, I, I, is it, I, do you think that why? Cause of coaching, do you think that they don't feel like their coaching is up to par or they don't want to lose a kid cause they want to win fucking games, which annoys the shit out of me. You no, know, it's just pride. Yeah. And ego. Yes. I, I that, hate that shit. And that's that. I mean, that, that's what I've seen from the outside. Like a lot of my like friends, like I've got a lot of close people that I've worked with um, that work on the youth soccer level. And it all just seems to be pride and ego. You know, everybody's the next big, coach or the next big thing so and they don't want to lose games and they're worried about winning games at like 12 years old which yeah, always it's, perpetually it's annoys me it's the aau mentality it's yeah the AAU mentality of it yep so. yep they want to be involved they want to get their their piece their cut but yeah all right so tommy i think uh that we've covered everything i wanted to cover is there anything else that you wanted to get into is there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to go through uh yeah um I go hope right ahead me in studio sometime Oh boy, uh, that's gonna be clipped. That's gonna be clipped. <laughs> well, you got you can reach out to your boy Cullinane, you know, and, uh, like, have him take care of that. I'm so, I, I I wish Cullinane luck over uh, at Magnolia. It was it was fun listening to. It. I thought uh, I thought Steve. I I thought Kirk knew Steve was gonna pop up in Magnolia. Oh, for he, sure he uh, did. For I, sure. I uh, I thought it was. I thought they they did a great show. I was very yeah. Too, so I, I think Cullinan now will definitely be like on his toes though, like just having his oh like, yeah, uh, he's the old, right yeah the, the, you know the, the ex boyfriend showed up you know dick around you know that yeah producing dick so <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, all right. Well, Tommy, I want to thank you for coming on, man. This was a long time coming. This is a great conversation. You really oh, covered okay. a lot of topics, man. Appreciate it, and uh, good luck with the podcast. Everybody, check them out too on WPRO. Don't crank call him, guys. Leave him alone. Like, leave him alone. Don't do not do it. Tim and Canton. But I will you know, take blind your calls. Daddy. I will take your calls. We can talk. I am. Yeah. So. And, and he'll play along a little bit. Just don't, don't, don't bombard him. Don't bombard him. I get him. it. I get yeah. it. <laughs> All right, Tom. Take care, man. Have a good one. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate you having me. Have a good one, man. You too, man. Take care. Take care, brother.